Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Wolfram Language Workshop for the Hour of Code. My name is Adrienne O'Brien and I'll be your host for this workshop. Um, just a couple of pointers before we get started. I encourage you throughout the workshop to uh, ask questions or comments or provide feedback in the Q&A pod right below uh, where you see my screen. Um, if we don't get to it during the presentation, we'll definitely follow up with you later. Okay, so we've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. For this workshop, we're going to be doing a couple of different things. Um, first, I want to show you, if you don't already have access to Wolfram Language, where you can go to get it. Um, a brief tutorial on getting started programming with the Wolfram Language. Uh, I'm going to give you a nice sneak peek uh, to our in-development programming lab platform. And then we're going to finish up with some nice activities uh, that you can use for the hour of code or for any time that you'd like to inject a little programming into your classroom. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is where can I get access to the Wolfram language? Um, you can use Mathematica and program in the Wolfram language in that environment. Also, last year we announced a partnership with the Raspberry Pi group, and so you can actually get access to Mathematica and the Wolfram language on the $35 Raspberry Pi device. It's really nice for that maker community and for in-classroom use and after-school programs. Another environment in which you can get access to the uh, Wolfram language is through the Wolfram Programming Cloud. And I'll be showing this a little bit later, um, but I wanted to show you real quick about how you can uh, get started programming right away. So this is the Wolfram Programming Cloud, and you can see down here, I can get started for free, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And then right here in this free pod, you can see it says get started. If you aren't signed up, um, you just need to log in with your uh, Wolfram ID, and then you can get started. I'm, I think I'm already signed in, so we should <laughs> you should see my dashboard here. So this is what the Wolfram Programming Cloud looks like. And well, I'll explore that a little bit more uh, here later on in the workshop. Um, and then obviously coming soon, we've got the Wolfram Programming Lab. Uh, and it'll follow the same subscription-based model that the Wolfram Programming Cloud follows. Uh, there's lots of things that you can do with the Wolfram language. I just wanted to give a quick sample of some of the things that you can do. Uh, you can program to create dynamic content. So here's a nice little interactive um, piece of courseware that, you know, gives you the equation of a line given two points. So this is all created in the Wolfram language. So more, uh, a little bit uh, more fun example, here's a ninja name generator using our newly released, our uh, version 10 recent release of the Wolfram language. Um, and so what this does is it goes through and it switches you know, the letters in your name uh, to create your new ninja name. And so I'm using our new cloud deploy function and our form function. And I can actually create a website now. And that was all the code that I needed. That was just it. And now I've got a new website. And I typed in Bob. And now I have my, <laughs> now I have my ninja name. Uh, there are more examples that you can find in the Wolfram Code Gallery, and I'll be pointing to that here in a little bit. Um, and then also the Dem Wolfram Demonstrations Project uh, has a vast, uh, I think close to 10,000 examples now of uh, interactive content that's created in the Wolfram language. Okay, so we're going to get started uh, on programming basics. Like I said, uh, for those of you that have already worked with Mathematica or the Wolfram language, you know, most of this stuff you already know. Uh, for those of you who've never programmed before, um, I just want to start with the bare bones so that when we get to those uh, hour of code activities, you really have a nice beginning level of, you know, how do I evaluate, how do I write programs, and then, um, you know, where to go for more information. Um, so a basic document in Mathematica or in the Wolfram Programming Cloud is called a notebook. Even this slideshow that I'm giving right now is a Mathematica notebook. Um, for the next couple of slides, we'll just be talking about basic syntax, evaluation, uh, making assignments, and then defining functions. <clears throat> in a notebook, um, it's broken down into units called cells. 
new cells are created by moving your cursor in between cells uh, where your cursor now becomes a horizontal bar. So if I look here, you can see that my um, cursor is vertical. And if I move down in between these two text cells, my cursor has now become horizontal. And I can start typing in there. And I've created a new cell. For our purposes of this workshop, I just want to focus on three different types of cells. We have input cells for coding, the output cells of the result, and then other non-evaluatable styled cells like text, titles, sections. <clears throat> By default, a newly created cell will be an input cell uh, ready for the Wolfram language to run. Uh, so below here, I've got an input cell. I've typed in 2 plus 2. I'm going to go ahead and evaluate that. And you can see now I have an input and an output. These two are linked together. You can see if I hover over, you can now see the cells. These two are linked. So there's my input. There's my output. These two uh, go together. So um, it doesn't need to be just numerical values. Outputs in the Wolfram language can range from numeric, symbolic, this is a graphic, this is an image, it can be dynamic content. So really a whole host of output types can be found in the output cell. Um, when you look to evaluate your code, so in order to get the result for, in order to generate that plot, you need to evaluate the code. So in order to evaluate, you need to make sure that you are clicked in or have that your cursor is inside whatever input cell that you want to evaluate. And then go ahead and hit Shift Enter. By hitting Shift Enter somewhere in that input cell, it will now tell the Wolfram language to run. And I've generated an output. Getting into our first computations. One of the really nice things about the Wolfram language is that you are able to code in freeform input, meaning that you are able to just type in plain English and you're able to get some code. In order to get that, what you're going to do is you would just type equal sign in the notebook. So I can click in here and I can type equal sign. And then you can just type in whatever you'd want uh, to accomplish. So here I've typed in solve 2x plus 1 equals 5. Once you have finished typing, press enter or the return key, and here is our result. One note about using the freeform input uh, feature is that try to keep the language as simple and direct as possible. One of the really nice things you can see here is that it's taken the natural language and given you the exact syntax. So even before knowing that there's this function called reduce, and this is how the argument is structured, I can just type in natural English, and it'll give me the correct syntax. And if I type on it, now it has replaced uh, the input um, with the correct syntax. Here's another more detailed input. So I want the graph of the sine of x uh, from 0 to pi over 2. Again, I can just replace my natural, natural language input uh, with the correct syntax. So I just mentioned that there's some basic syntax, and I mentioned that there are functions in the Wolfram language. Um, a couple of things to note uh, when programming in the Wolfram language, that Wolfram language is case sensitive. Inside those functions, you may or may not have arguments, and those are enclosed in square brackets here and separated by commas. I know that maybe if you've coded before, um, parentheses, those are just used uh, for grouping and controlling the order of evaluation. Built-in functions start with a capital letter, always. Um, defined functions and symbols will be colored black. And then you'll see throughout this workshop that I sometimes will have a semicolon at the end of my input. That doesn't indicate a new line. What it's saying is, hey, I want you to run, but I don't want to see the output. So the semicolon at the end of a line just suppresses the output. OK, so let's take a look at arguments. 
Almost anything can be used as an argument to a function. So here I have the function called image rotate. I have an argument. This is the image that I'd like to use. And then the second argument is the how much of a rotation to use. So I'm going to press shift enter to go ahead and evaluate it. Now notice if this had been a lowercase r, you can see now that image rotate is now blue meaning that the Wolfram language does not understand that function that you're trying to use, that you'll need to make it an uppercase. Oh, and so an interesting thing that just popped up here is that we have a nice um, suggestions bar about uh, what functions you'd like to use. You can just copy paste images into a new function. So I'm going to use the output that was generated off of this code here. Um, I'm just going to copy paste into this color negate you can see here another visual clue that something is off um, I've typed in color negate and I have the square brackets to indicate that there should be an argument in there but this red up arrow is saying whoa red flag you have too few arguments given and then it gives us a really nice help about what should be in there it says color negate and there should be an image um, as the argument. So I'm going to go ahead and copy in the rotated image and there's my output. Talking about functions themselves, I know I alluded to the the color indication. So if we were looking to find the sign of zero and we start typing sin square brackets, you notice again that sign is colored blue. Uh, the Wolfram language doesn't understand what that is. This is why the result is essentially unevaluated. So let's take a look here. What happened? OK, yep, it doesn't understand what, what I'm asking it to do. Um, so if I started typing again, and again, popped up, which, which function would you like to use? I'd like to use sign. And then I want sign of 0. And it evaluated for me. Again, noticing the color that this sign is colored black. This sign up here is colored blue. Another basic um, syntax that I want to elaborate on are lists. We use lists in a variety of different ways, and they are denoted by curly brackets and separated by commas. We use lists as vectors, so I can combine these two lists. We indicate bounds with lists. So this is plotting the sine function. And I'm using the list here to indicate I want x to range from negative 2 pi to 3 pi. We also use lists to indicate iterators. So if I'm looking at the table function, I want values to be squared. And I want those values to range from 1 to 10. Okay. Now, if I added another element to that list, again, looking at squared numbers, starting at 1, going to 10, but now I want it to be in steps of 2. 1 squared, 3 squared, 5 squared, etc. Lists will also be used for sets. So this is the function member Q, and it says, taking a look at this list is a second argument a member of that list. So if I go ahead and evaluate, it says, yes, C is a member of that list. If I gave it something like G, it will return false. Going on to assignments. There are two ways to assign var values to symbols, using set and set delayed. Set is an equal sign, and set delayed is a colon equal sign. If the assignment is a fixed value and not going to change, then you'd want to use set. Set is an immediate assignment. So once I evaluate x equals 7, x is now always associated with 7. It evaluated the right-hand side of the equal sign. So if I wanted to use x now in computation, it'll use 7. Notice how the coloring changed from black to blue. Oh, from blue to black, sorry. <laughs> Variables can be other things other than numeric values. So for instance, y is now this graphic of a circle. So that was set, the single, the equal sign. If I'm talking about set delayed, this is a delayed assignment. In other words, the right-hand side is recomputed when the left-hand side is called. I'm going to look at an example now using the built-in function now. 
If I wanted to take a look at what the now function does, I created a hyperlink here to the documentation. So now gives a date object representing the current time and moment. So it should give me the time as it is right now. So for T1, this is the immediate assignment. I am now assigning this time to T1. But with T2, I'm saying once T2 is called, I want you to recompute. Notice how there is no output with that. So now if I am in this cell here, I'm asking it to, re <clears throat> to run this code. You'll notice how T1 is the same, but now if I evaluate again, T2 is going to change because with set delayed, it gets reevaluated every time that T2 is used. So you can see that changing, albeit slightly, but um, you can see T2 changing at every time that I reevaluate that line of code. Okay, we're going to move on to defining functions. Uh, functions are assignments that give transformation rules to patterns. So what we're, we're going to do is look at a function that takes a number and squares it. Notice how we're using the set delayed. So notice how the function f is colored blue. I'm going to go ahead and assign x squared to the function. I'm going to test it. Let's get rid of that. Test function f of x. Oh, I really wanted to show you the symbolic version of x. Well, you notice how x is still colored black. Well, that's because on that previous slide, I had assigned x 7 to x. So let's go ahead and clear x. And so now you can see that it is turned blue. Let's reevaluate that. Okay, x is now squared. If I submit 3 to the function, it squares it. And again, using the clear function, I can clear it. Um, for functions, you can also use multiple arguments. So in the function f, I just had one argument, x. But in this function g, I'm using two. So I can pass it two values. That was a very brief crash course in Wolfram language programming. By no means did we cover everything. Um, so I encourage you to visit the Wolfram training site here uh, to continue your learning. Uh, we have lots of courses available. We have lots of on-demand courses that you can uh, view on your own time uh, to continue your learning. Okay, what I'd like to do now is give you a little sneak peek at the Wolfram Programming Lab. Um, in the Wolfram Programming Lab, there will be lots of coding activities to use in your classroom as a part of the curriculum or to stimulate interest in programming. Um, I want to take a, a, a look at some of these activities, and we call these activities explorations. We're going to be looking at two. The first one is reversible words. These explorations are designed to answer a question for an interesting topic or to investigate a real world application. With this one, with reversible words, we're really looking at how can you programmatically find palindromes. So let's make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Again, this is still a notebook. This is still Wolfram language. In this exploration, you'll see um, a header title to the slide. You'll also get a narrative and then some example code. Down below, you'll see this code zone where we engage the where we prompt the student to engage in the programming. So for this one, what it says is, uh, we want to write the word rhinoceros backwards. So we use the, we use the function string reverse. 
And down here in the code zone, it says edit this code to reverse your name or any other word you'd want. And again, the students can play around with it, see what it looks like to reverse different words, etc. Now going on to the next slide. What we're doing here is we're giving the list of words in a dictionary. The list is big, so we hide some of the output. I clicked on the view more, and this gives us um, a little bit more information. It, it gives us these are all the languages that we have in dictionary lookup. So our next activity is um, edit this to get the words for another language. So I can choose, let's choose Latin. The list is long, so I'm not going to scroll through all of that, but it just gives an idea that there are lots of words in a variety of languages. The next step in our exploration is to select words from a dictionary. Now again, the explorations are really designed for an immersive style of learning, meaning that I'm not going to go through and tell them this is what the function select does, this is what the function dictionary lookup does, this is what string length lookup does. By giving a brief narrative around the code, you should be able to figure out what's happening. So what this code length is doing is select words that are of length 10 from dictionary lookup. If you want to know a little bit more about what's going on, I can scroll down and see exactly what this code is comprised of. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down though to the code zone. Edit this code to find all the words of a particular length other than 10. So this one gives us the length of 10. Let's see what words are length of 15. Say 20. Again, playing around with it. Next step is to find all the reversible words. So this one is select the words from dictionary lookup where the reverse of the word is the same as the word itself. So there we've answered our question. How do we programmatically find all the palindromes? Well, this is the code that does it. And that's a general feeling for these Wolfram Programming Lab explorations. There will be a narrative to walk a student through a particular problem or interesting application, give them enough of the tools to answer it, and then give them challenges or practice problems so that they can do it on their own. So here's another exploration. This one is called Map the Views from Tall Buildings. So this one is an interesting application to introduce geographic computation to students. So the first step in our exploration is to find the location of a building. So this one uses our um, control equals where it understands what our new entities. Um, so it has all sorts of information about the Empire State Building. And one of them is the coordinates. So we generated the coordinates for the Empire State Building. Then using GeoListPlot, we took those coordinates and plotted it on a, on a map. A little bit more information, and it will probably be good to um, pause here a little bit. That box with the, the equal sign in it, um, to get the natural language input field, you type control equals. What you typed into it is automatically translated, if possible, into a precise representation that the Wolfram language understands. So again, control equal, then typed it Empire State Building, and we have lots of built-in information about that specific thing. So here, instead of using the Empire State Building, I'll go ahead and type in Eiffel Tower. This is a product or platform that we are currently working on and hope to have uh, released here in the near future, but can't get access to it just yet, um, but we will have it soon. So here is the map of the Eiffel Tower. Let's go on to the next slide. The next step in our exploration is to find the height of a building. Again, using building data, I can go ahead and 
use Wolfram language to uh, bring back the height and then convert it into meters. If you're noticing here, we're using a shorthand. The percent sign stands for the last result. So it's taking this last result in feet and converting it to meters. So that was the Empire State Building. Again, I can change it to another building. And it gave me the height. Map the view from the top of a building. Um, here's the code that calculates how far, given the height of the Empire State Building, how far is your visible region. So we're putting together the coordinates of the Empire State Building, the height of the Empire State Building, and then generating a nice map that illustrates what is my visible region from that height given those coordinates. And again, some more information about what's going on uh, will be available to students and teachers inside the exploration itself. Going down to the code zone, again, we can uh, type in our own, our own buildings. Let's see, they suggested the Great Pyramid. Great Pyramid. And again, we're looking for the visible region at the top of the Great Pyramid. Last slide here uh, goes one step further beyond just generating um, a nice map, but it also turns it into a function to make it a little bit easier to use. So here we have an introduction to functions. We've built this function called view map, which takes a building name and basically does the same thing that we had done on the previous slide, where it just plops it into that natural language input. Again, walking a student through a particular problem or question or application, showing them the code, really giving them the tools to see what's going on, but then take it one step further and play around with it. So really excited. We've got a lot of these explorations in the works and um, super excited when it uh, will release here in the near future. So let me go back to my presentation. So that was a preview of the Wolfram Programming Lab. Let's get on to some Hour of Code activities. So what I'm going to show you is <clears throat> some sample activities on the Code Gallery site that you can play around with in the Wolfram Programming Cloud. I'm going to be going over um, the Hello World example, the Pop Art example, and then Deploy an Age Guessing website. And if you're wondering, everything that I'm talking about here is available on the Hour of Code website here. I'm just going into specific code gallery examples. And let's take a look at the first one here. Implement Hello World in the Cloud. So this is a website. It gives you the code, how it works, etc. What I'm going to do is go ahead and open it in the live version. You can see that I'm in the Wolfram Programming Cloud. I've opened the example, Hello World. For the purposes of the workshop, I'm going to go ahead and close this sidebar so you can see this notebook a little bit better. But just so you know, this will help you if you wanted to create a new notebook, if you wanted to take a look at your files. Also, documentation is available on the cloud. So if you click on that book, you can have access to all the uh, documentation that you find on uh, Mathematica desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and close that sidebar real quick. OK, so implement Hello World in the Cloud. This is one of those beginning uh, programming activities that you see um, 
on various websites, you know, how do you print or how do you produce Hello World? Um, producing Hello World in the Wolfram language is very trivial. Um, basically, it's just a string that's printed out. Well, what we want to do is make it um, make it a little bit bolder. Um, going through this code gallery example, you can see that okay, yes, I've printed Hello World. If you wanted to printed five times. Again, taking a look at the programming here, I want to print hello world, do that five times. You can also say hello world by deploying it to the web. If I deploy just the text string, what I'll get yeah. What I'll get is just this text string here, hello world. Well it's it's not very pretty to look at. Let's make something a little bit more interesting. So what will happen here is that I am deploying Hello World. Now I know there's a lot of code in here, um, but it's basically all this formatting. I want it to be size 80 font. I want it to be orange. I want the font fan family to be Verana. I want it to be framed. And this piece of code right here, permission set to public. What that will allow you and your students to do is to be able to share that web address with anyone. So if I go ahead and click on it, I get a nice um, image of Hello World. Now what you can do is once you've gotten that far, you can mm, change it, do whatever you like with that code. So what I did was I went ahead and copied the code, the final code to produce Hello World. I opened up my sidebar and I clicked on new. That'll create a new notebook for me. And you can see that it popped up a new tab. I'm now going to create a new cell. I'm going to paste my code. I'm going to go ahead and evaluate that just so you can see that everything works just fine. Yep, okay. But instead of hello world, you can type whatever you want. I just So it can be whatever text you'd want. Or instead of orange, let's make it blue. And there are all sorts of ways that you can play around and explore the language on your own. It's a really nice, simple beginner's activity. Let me close out of some of these tabs. So that was the Hello World example. Let's take a look at the Pop Art example. Turn any image into pop art with the Wolfram language image processing functions. So again, I'm going to go ahead and open in the live version. Again, you can access these if you have any type of tier subscription to the programming cloud. This is the free plan, so it should look pretty much the same if you, you know, have a, a free version of it. Again, I'm going to close the sidebar here for a moment. Let's walk through this one. So here's the code that I would need, but let's see how it works. Built into the Wolfram language is all sorts of data. Um, one of them is a picture of this house here. So I'm going to go ahead and assign this image of the house to my variable image. You can see that the image symbol turned from blue to black. Now what I'm going to do is break that image down into components. You can see here that I've used the semicolon again. That means I've suppressed the output. And then what I'm going to do, give each component a different color using the colorize function. And there you have it. You've made pop art with an image. Now again, let's say that I wanted to do this change it up a little bit. So I'm going to copy, I'm going to go into my, my sort of working notebook. So this was the Hello World example. Ooh, spell it correctly. Here we go. And this is the pop art example. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that into there. This was the using the example data of the house. 
But let's say that I wanted to use a different image. So this is going to be my image. And I'm going to go ahead and import going to import an image that lives online. And so instead of using this example data in a house, I'm going to change that. And instead, I want it to use my image, which is an image of the um, Chicago city. So again, a couple new couple new functions there. I use the import function that takes um, what lives at that address. If you wanted more information about the import function, again, we can use our documentation and search for import. Here's information about the import function. And there we go. Pop art of Chicago. Let's take a look at our last activity. Deploy an age guessing website. So make a website that guesses people's ages based on their name. I'm going to go ahead and open the live version. Close that sidebar. So we've got two versions of this, one that uses a form and one that uses an API function. I'm going to focus more on the form. Um, so we're going to produce a form that you can use. Let's take a look at how it works. The most common age is a predictor for given names that is built into the Wolfram language. It analyzes statistical distributions of ages to determine the most common age for that given name. So if I look, so here's my entity value of Aaron. And if I want to take a look at the most common age for Aaron, 27. Now what you can do is you can utilize that um, to make a website. So here's my form function that generates a form. I'm going to get a name. It's going to look like enter name. And what it's going to receive is this given name. <clears throat> and then it's going to generate some text. You are probably, it'll generate the most common age, and then old. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So again, going back to the code, I've got a form. Variable is name used here and here. What I want it to display on the form, though, is enter name. It's going to give me a given age, and then I'm going to produce some text and determine the most common age uh, for that name. So if I use Aaron again, you are probably 27 years old. Let's take a look at some other ones. You are probably 40 years old. Let's take a look at, see how it handles my six-year-old daughter. She is, oh, three years off, but pretty close. So it's a nice, um, fun example of how to use programming to create your own website. Now, again, we can change this. Hour of Code is exploring programming and making their own programs. Here's my pop art example. So let's make a new section here. Age guessing website. Okay, so I'm going to put that in there. So I'm going to change this up a little bit. I'll say instead of you are probably, I'll say um, I predict that you are, and then it'll give the most common age. There are so many different things that you can do with this. This is just one pretty basic example of manipulating the code that's already there. Again, clicking on that. I predict that you are 27 years old. So there are lots of different things that you can do uh, to make it your own, to have students um, 
you know, program with the Wolfram language to edit and explore. So I wanted to, again, visit the Wolfram Language for Hour of Code website just to review some of the things that we've done for additional resources. On this page, we've got some really nice things to help you keep getting, get started, um, more information. Um, we've got a video here about uh, getting introduced to the Wolfram Language. Another link to the code gallery. This is where I got those examples from. So you can see the Hello World example. There are lots of different activities that you can have your students do. So here's bur blur faces in an image, um, color map by country, correct and grade keyboard practice, etc. Lots of different examples that students can do. Uh, to explore the Wolfram language, to explore programming, and how you can apply it to different uh, subject areas and different um, applications. In addition to the code gallery, we also have this fast introduction for programmers listed here. This website is really nice. It, it'll go over some of the things that I mentioned earlier in the workshop, but then go into some more um, detailed examples. So here we have uh, more information about built-in functions. You can see that each word starts with a capital letter. Yes, um, this one's talking more about demonstration or the documentation, um, and it just goes through and gives you a nice overview of of the various introductory level um, things that you can do with the Wolfram language. If you have any questions, you know this would be or any issues, this would be a nice resource to first look. Um, if you're having, you know, if you if you need more information. I did mention a couple of these things before, but I wanted to touch on them again. Uh, the, doc the documentation inside the Wolfram language is extensive. Uh, we basically touched on some core language, um, like here is the freeform input, lots of information, let me make that a little bit bigger, lots of information about how to do it, examples, different options you can give, um, how is the function um, structured, etc. So I can't stress enough, using the documentation is a, is a really nice place uh, to, get, to get help. If, you're, if you have a specific question, however, a really great resource for you is the Wolfram community. So this is a nice place for users and non-users to discuss and ask questions. So maybe you had a really nice example of something and you wanted to share it. So here, here's a post that we made about using turning lights on and off, LED lights on and off, with the Wolfram language on the Raspberry Pi device. So this goes through. It tells you how to do it, gives you some, gives you some code, and you can discuss. Um, and I won't go through all of this thread, but you know, on here there are some users that are saying, oh, I had some issues, can you help me? And we are very good about responding to users' questions and comments. I also mentioned the Wolfram Demonstrations Project. The Wolfram Demonstrations Project um, is a database of, like I said, close to 10,000 interactive demonstrations. These can be used in your classroom, or you can take a look at um, take a look at the code, see what's possible uh, with the Wolfram language. One last thing that I wanted to mention, um, especially with the Hour of Code, uh, one of the really nice things about social media is being is for students to be able to showcase what they've done. Um, now, obviously, you can go on and tweet about it um, or post on Facebook, uh, but one of the fun things about you know, using desktop Mathematica or the Wolfram language is that I can actually programmatically send a, uh, a tweet. So here I am. I'm going to go ahead and send a Twitter message. Just completed my first hour of code with the Wolfram language. Let's see. Yep. 
and I've got it. Just completed my first hour of code with the Wolfram language. So some fun applications in there. Um, so like I said, that was <laughs> pretty fast, pretty intense. Uh, crash course in programming with the Wolfram language, and then also going over activities that you can use for the Hour of Code. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes remaining, and I wanted to see if we had any questions. Um, like I said, you can type them into the Q&A pod. Um, is there a good Twitter hashtag for getting help? <laughs> um, you know what? I feel like we do have... Um, one for Wolfram language. I'll need to take a look at that. Follow up to define near future. I'm I so Robert G had a question um, about. I'm guessing the programming lab. Like I showed, we've got a lot of the content ready. Um, just needs a little bit of tweaking. Um, best <laughs> best I can say is near future. Um, one of the things that I will say about the programming lab, though. Um, is if you are interested in uh, perhaps being a part of a beta test of the programming lab. That is something that we're looking into. And so if you'd like to either email me or email education support at wolfram.com, uh, we can see about getting you um, into that. And my email address is adrianao at wolfram.com. Uh, where can we find the link to the Hour of Code activities? Is there a link? I think I missed it. So let's go ahead and just post that. Wolfram.com slash language slash hour dash of dash code. Um, and there you can get links to uh, the, the code gallery, uh, which I was showing before. Um, it's a really nice, yeah, I was just there. So this is what I was using for my Hour of Code activities, the Wolfram Language Code Gallery. And so that is wolfram.com slash language slash gallery. We have another question to programming with the Raspberry Pi. Does the Pi need to be connected to the internet at any stage? Um, if you are doing, if you're running any functions or any computation that requires access to our knowledge base, so anything um, that requires, you know, data off of um, our servers, then yes, you'd need an, an internet connection. Uh, but for the most part, you know, a lot of those things can be done locally without an internet connection. And obviously, to get updates to the language, you'll need to be connected as well. So we've got um, a question from Truman here, for those who learn best uh, from hard copy resources, is there a book or workbook you can recommend or even a PDF file to print out? Um, I believe uh, in the resources for this event, uh, we may be able to post some of this information, including the notebook. Uh, but <laughs> We, you know, Mathematica and the Wolfram language has been around for more than 25 years. We, we used to have, you know, a book of functions and how to, how to program, uh, but the book got too big. <laughs> we can't, um, can't print it anymore, so that's why we have everything online uh, with our documentation. A thank you to att uh, for attending our workshop uh, for the Wolfram language for the Hour of Code. Um, you know, again, let us know if you have any questions.